starting my stopwatch now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out this morning. Um, I would like to start. If everyone, we could just go around the room, if you could stand up and introduce yourselves. I think it would be great. Um, no, I'm serious, guys. I'm really serious. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about movies today. I hope that's what you're here to, to talk about. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about um, the bad news and the good news of independent film. And, and you know, if you're at all like me and you read the trades and you're involved in film conversations, it's mostly bad news. I think that what we hear about is the death of the middle class of independent films. You know, where are those cool $5 million movies that used to break out of Sundance in, in 1998? And, and, and why are they not buying those or making those? Or even when they do, why are they not promoting them? And, uh, and why is nobody going to see them? Um, people are talking about what VOD means uh, for the death of the theatrical experience. Is it hurting it? Is it this glut of material in the marketplace keeping people from going to see things in the theaters? We're going to talk about the migration to TV and um, are all the great indie filmmakers going to TV? Not that I did it, maybe a little bit. Um, and, and what that means. And, and these are all issues that we're definitely going to talk about. Um, but for me, uh, there's one thing that keeps coming up over and over in my career. I'm gonna put this up so I don't have to have hunched shoulders. Um, and, and that one thing that keeps coming to me is uh, this very simple phrase. Um, and I'm gonna take a note from Tony Robbins, motivational speaker here for a second. And we're gonna have something that we're gonna really focus in on. And, and that is these simple words, the cavalry isn't coming. And I'm looking around like Tony, I'm gonna let it sit. And then Tony repeats it. The cavalry is not coming. And I say this because we've all heard these amazing tales of how that 21-year-old kid had a script and his cousin worked in the mail room at Warner Brothers and he gave it to him and his script got up to the head of Warner Brothers and they loved it and they bought it for a million dollars and got it made. And that's an exciting story, but a super dangerous one because I don't know anyone that's happened to. Maybe that's happened once, but I had a very, very different career trajectory. I was here in Austin in college living in um, shitty apartments all around town, the Brownstone on 51st and Lamar, um, where they don't allow you to work on your car and cinder blocks on the, uh, in the apartment complex, um, and a rat-infested uh, duplex on uh, Old Torf. Um, and, and I was sitting there thinking, I'm inspired, I'm excited, I want to be a filmmaker, I have no connections. How the f everybody keeps saying just pick up a camera and do it, but like, even if I do that, how, how am I going to get there? And I think that's where most people are, and that's, I feel like if I have a place to be useful, that's what I want to speak to, is what can you do when you are absolutely nowhere and feeling you are full of magic and ideas? So, we're going to go through some step-by-step -step Tony Robbins processes here, guys, and see if we can get practical and I can leave you with at least something useful. Um, the first step is the $3 short film. I can definitely speak to this. Uh, we're in a place now, obviously, where technology is so cheap. There's no excuse for you not to be making short films on the weekends with your friends shot on your iPhone. We had a feature film at Sundance last year, uh, this past year, called Tangerine that was a tot shot entirely on an iPhone and did really well, sold to Magnolia, and, and so no excuses not to be doing that. And I, I bring this up because a lot of people think, well, I mean, what, even if I make like a decent movie on this phone, like who's gonna watch it, what is this all about? Um, and I'll just share one personal story with you, which is that my brother and I lived in Austin for a long time. We worked as editors, trying to get our day jobs and our money go, and we, uh, saved up enough money by doing this corporate documentary to make our first feature film. The film was called Vince Del Rio. It starred me as a runner from the South Texas border trying to get a spot at the Olympic trials. You can see why this didn't work out so well already. We spent $65,000 on this movie and it was a steaming pile of dog diarrhea. And we almost gave up making movies. Um, and we were sitting on Jay's couch in South Austin. 
And I remember looking at him, and he was depressed, and I was just slightly less depressed enough to say, we should get up, we should make a movie like we did when we were kids. But all we had was our parents' video camera, which we knew had a dead pixel in the middle of it. Um, and I said, I'm going to get a tape. You come up with a movie idea, and like we're shooting as soon as I come back. And so I was back in 20 minutes, and, and Jay said, something weird happened to me yesterday. I was trying to like get the outgoing greeting of my answer machine going, and I like couldn't get it right, and I kind of had a nervous breakdown. Um, I recorded it about 157 times. And I was like, that's great. This feels like us. This is like funny, but kind of tragic, just like us. Um, and so I said, OK, put the camera on. I'm going out the door and just film me. And he's like, well, we don't have lighting kit. Like, the microphone is the one on the camera, like where you can't hear anything. And I was like, I don't care. We're doing this. So we shot one 20 minute improvised take. We edited it down to about seven minutes. And, and we watched it with our friends. And we're like, there's something interesting here. It's a shame there's a dead pixel in it, and it looks and sounds like shit. Um, but our friend David Zellner was like, I think you should just submit this around to some festivals, just to see. And that $3 movie was our first movie that got into Sundance, and it played at South by Southwest here 12 years ago. And it changed really everything for us, because we realized that um, it really doesn't matter what your movie looks like. If you have a voice, if you have something interesting to say, um, they will like you, and they will program you. So step one, if you are nowhere like I was, is <clears throat> the $3 short film. I recommend making one of these every weekend with your smartest group of friends who want to be filmmakers. They don't have to be film savvy. You want a group of like four or five people, someone who's ideally charismatic to be your lead actor, and then just smart kind of interesting people to help you curate this thing. It should be a one scene, five minutes, ideally it's comedic because those program well at film festivals. And uh, short films also program well, like short shorts, that's really key. Um, and your first ones are gonna suck, mine did. I mean, I don't know, maybe you'll make a great one. There's some people that do that, I hate those people. Um, and, and, but there'll be like a little nugget when you show your friends and they'll be like, this is four minutes and 58 seconds of garbage, but that little giggle you guys had right there was interesting. So then you expand on that, you cut everything else out, you start honing in on it. And somewhere, you're gonna discover that you have something unique to offer. And it usually lies in those weird conversations you are having with your friends, your loved ones, your siblings, between like midnight and three in the morning when everybody's loopy and or drunk or stoned. And you are laughing uncontrollably because you share this unique sense of humor about something that one of your friends did or you did. And at the risk of saying you should make a self-indulgent film for your first movie, you should absolutely make a self-indulgent film for your first movie because that's your special stuff. That's like your judge. And when you tap into that, you show it to your friends, they'll be honest with you, and you're gonna find, it might be two weeks later, it might be two months later, it might be two years of doing this, that you have something unique to offer. And this is gonna be the start of your career. So this whole time, you should be having a really strong day job to take care of yourself. Um, and you should be saving a little bit of money. You, this is a hard career, so don't eat out. Don't buy clothes. Like, save up your money. Because now you're gonna have to travel to film festivals, okay? You're gonna submit this to every film festival you can. And you're gonna go and you're gonna start meeting other filmmakers that you like and other actors that you like. And you're gonna start building your community and the programmers there are gonna like you and they're gonna wonder, ooh, I wanna, I wanna program a feature from this kid, that would be great. And the whole time you're going around this festival, there is a small chance that an agent is going to sign you and say, I love your movie, I wanna pitch you to direct a movie, the cavalry's coming, it's coming. Cavalry's probably not coming, I'm just gonna be honest with you. What's probably gonna happen is you're gonna be writing a script this whole time, a feature script that's based upon the look and the feel of your $5 movie, okay? That can be made for less than $1,000. And this is gonna be the next step in your career, okay? The way you're gonna do this is you're gonna go into temp work. This is brutal. These next two years are gonna suck, okay? <laughs> Ideally, if you are in college and hearing this, don't major in film, minor in film, study Spanish or Mandarin, because then you can get jobs translating for $25 an hour wherever you want to go. It's the best thing any film student can do. 
Or if you don't do that, just wait tables. There's a reason why artists wait tables. It's flexible, you can get your shifts covered. You're gonna spend a year making this movie. You're gonna write this script based upon what I call the available material school of filmmaking, which is not, it takes place in a spaceship because you can't do that on $1,000. But what you can do is take a meeting with everyone who loves you and everyone who wants to support you and say, what do you have that you can lend to me at my disposal to make a film? When Jay and I made the puffy chair, it was very, very clear. We had my apartment in Brooklyn, my wife Katie's apartment in Brooklyn. My street was really quiet and I knew we could shoot on that. I had a van because I was playing in bands, so I was like, mm, road movie, that's good for a van. Uh, there was a furniture store in Maine that was going out of business and we had two identical chairs we could get for like $300. I was like, great, I'll burn one of them. That will be our big stunt in the movie. It'll be awesome. And, and we reverse engineered a movie that fit inside of these things so that we knew we wouldn't have to wait to make it. We knew we could make this movie at a cheap price. And you gather up that group of friends you made your shorts with and you guys are gonna go out with a crew of five to eight people and the way you're going to do this, and please don't print this, this is just for the room. Um, you're going to go to some box stores that might rhyme with like um, clone repo, and you're going to buy lights and extension cords and all these things, and they have a 30-day return policy where they give all your money back. <laughs> you're gonna shoot your movie within 30 days and everything is going to be free. <laughs> you're going to go to another store that rhymes with rest, lie, and they have cameras that you can buy with only like a 10% restocking fee. So you're going to buy those cameras and then you're going to return them. Or if you want, you can just shoot them still uncompressed on your iPhone if you like that look. Might make you more unique. Either way, these are the things you're going to do to keep it cheap, okay? And if you have an agent at this point, they might be saying, don't go do this. I can get you some money to make this. If you allow them to do that, you will end up in development for five years and you will not get your movie made because you're just a short filmmaker with nothing behind you. Go make this movie on your own. The cavalry is not coming. So, with this movie you make, there is a chance that the movie's gonna go to Sundance and it's gonna sell for a million dollars. It might happen. Probably not. Probably what's gonna happen is you made something really interesting that's a little bit flawed because you're a new filmmaker and it's your first feature. And that's okay, but it's unique and it has a voice and you're still doing temp work, and you're running around to every single festival that you develop relationships with through your short film, okay? They want you back, they're excited to program you. And this is where the capital of film festival starts to come in. You're definitely gonna get an agent at this point because you made a feature that works. That's good, we'll talk about that in a second. But there are movie stars at these film festivals. Every film festival has like three to five movie stars at it that come and get the sponsors in to do it, okay? And what you wanna do is get your movie in front of these people. And when you have this agent, they're gonna say, should I bring you scripts to direct? Should I bring you this? Say, no, 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 I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to send my $1,000 movie that's inspired but kind of flawed to every single actor in this agency that means something. And I want you to set screenings every other week so that I can get actors to fall in love with my work and then build another movie with them. And this is gonna where you start to climb. A lot of these movie stars are gonna be like, fuck that, I don't wanna make a movie on an iPhone with this dude, he does not know what he's doing. But one of them, within two weeks, two months, is gonna respond, and he was, let's call him Randy Hercules, okay? Randy Hercules was on like a CBS show that ran for like six years. He's super rich and he's super depressed because he hates his show. And he is dying to do something creative and you're gonna meet with Randy Hercules and you're gonna say, Randy, I saw your show, you're really good in it, but I know you're better than this, and you'll have done your research and you'll have watched Randy in interviews and you'll have said, I might be able to use this darkness of Randy to do something interesting. And you say, I'm going to build you a role, Randy. What is the role you absolutely want to play and that no one has offered you? And Randy is going to fall in love with you and follow you to the ends of the earth. So as much as your agent is going to tell you, you've already made your $1,000 movie, it's time to go pitch you for big directing jobs, which you'll never get, by the way. And even if you get them, you won't want them because all the directing jobs out there that are open are terrible. You are gonna do the unthinkable. You're going to make another $1,000 movie, but this one has Randy fucking Hercules in it. And this one is gonna be the one that starts to monetize your career. Because even if you make a stinker with Randy Hercules in it, there's no way you're selling this movie for less than $50,000.
and all your friends who worked on your cheap movie with you, you're gonna give them big points in the movie because you are a communist. You're developing a group of friends and you're all in this shit together and you're gonna say, all right, because I've been temping my Mandarin or I've been serving um, ceviche, I've saved up some money here. We're gonna spend another thousand dollars on this movie, but this time when it sells, you, my beloved sound person slash lighting person slash assistant editor, are gonna get 10% of the movie because you've been working so hard. And Randy Hercules, you're gonna get 20% of the movie, and then you go to Randy and say, you're so rich, would you just give me those points back and give it to some of the crew? And he'll do it because he's in love with you and he's rich and sad. <laughs> and you get to share all of this. And you make this movie, and it's gonna be a little better than your last movie because you learned something from your mistakes. And you dug in on Randy Hercules, and you found something great. And this time, rather than be at those B-tier festivals, you're probably gonna land at a high B or a low A-tier festival. You might go to Sundance and sell it for a million dollars. It might happen. Probably not gonna happen. It's just the way it is, but that's okay. Because now you have a movie that has extreme value on VOD because of Randy Hercules' six years on his CBS show. And this is where I say, God bless VOD. This is a great thing for independent film. Please, please do not reject VOD. Please do not be afraid of it. Please do not be attached to your early movies playing in movie theaters. It's very important that you don't blow all your money promoting in a theater that's going to lose that money and you will have no more money to make movies. It's important that you own this Randy Hercules movie. Someone's gonna buy it from you. Let them put it out on VOD and a place like Netflix or HBO and you will probably make anywhere from 50 to $500,000 on this movie by the very presence of Randy Hercules and that the movie doesn't suck. That's just an empirical value for that movie, okay? And this is great. You got some money, your friends have some money, you're sharing in things, and more importantly, the industry is starting to take notice of you. You've definitely got your agent beating down your door now saying, okay, remember last time when I said the cavalry was coming? I, I was wrong that time, but this time, the cavalry is really fucking coming. I can take you out and get you directing jobs, I can get you rewrite jobs. You just gotta go take a bunch of general meetings, and if you do that, you will take meetings for a year and nothing will happen. And I'm telling you this from experience. It is very hard to turn this down because it's so tempting. But this is where you want to make your move into TV because as the death of the middle class of film has happened, it has been rebirthed in television. The way you used to make really awesome $5 million movies that didn't have movie stars in them and had great, cool, original content, that's happening in cable TV right now. And that's where you want to go. And if you have made a good $1,000 movie with Randy Hercules, you're going to sell a pitch hands down, okay? And you'll make some money off of that, which is really good. So, you're gonna be thinking, oh my God, this is incredible. I'm gonna become the next big showrunner. I sold this pitch, they're excited about it. You might get to make that show. Probably not, because <laughs> that's just the way it is. Um, it's probably gonna get put into turnaround. But you made some money, which is good. And you learned something, and you said, hmm. They don't want to make this because it costs $2 million an episode for them to make it, and they don't want to risk that much. But using my principles of indie filmmaking, I could probably take Randy Hercules or one of Randy Hercules' friends who now likes me because they've seen the movie and they want to be like Randy Hercules in a little project, and I could probably make some episodes of a TV show independently and license them back to these companies at like a quarter or a fifth of the price and I would own everything, and I would almost be like a TV studio. So you're gonna take out Randy Hercules and his friend, Dingleberry Jones, <laughs> and Randy and Dingleberry are gonna play in a small two-hander that's shot mostly in apartments, just like you did your first micro-budget movie, and you're gonna make two episodes and outline the rest, and I guarantee you, you will sell that show to a young and hungry place that wants TV content from a vetted, cool independent filmmaker like yourself. And now you're gonna to start to make some actual money. And all your friends around you who've been working for years are gonna be like, you're the first one of us to make some money, this is exciting. I have an idea, I wanna make my first thousand dollar movie with Randy Hercules. And you're gonna be like, this is great, I have some money now. And you're gonna have the opportunity to do what you didn't get for yourself, is to raise some people up and throw a thousand dollars at them and say, Go for it. If you shit the bed, I don't care. It's a write-off. If you win, I want like 15% of your profits, but take 
85% of it and share it with your crew because you guys are doing all the work because you're a communist and this is good. Communism's good here, guys. And so now you're like kind of at this like weird crossroads in your life where you're thinking, okay, made these short films, made these two micro budget features, one with Randy, got my TV show going, I'm making money, I'm not rich, I'm sustainable, I'm helping my friends, and your agent's gonna call you and say, I know the first time I called you, I said the cavalry was coming, I was wrong, and the second time I said the cavalry was coming, and, it, and I was wrong, but this time, the cavalry is fucking beating down your door, and she's kinda right, because you are of value now, and you do have a chance to let the cavalry in. Um, good chance you'll open it up, and they aren't there anyway. Another chance you open it up, they come in, and you don't want to make a movie with the cavalry because they don't make the kind of movies you like, and they're going to try and tell you exactly how to make the movie. And you're going to be at this crossroads. This is like in Oh, the Places You Go when you get to the waiting place. You know, like, people, what, what am I going to do? And you're going to look at your career, and you're going to feel like, I'm a little tired because every single project I have made, I've had to self-generate. And it's getting fucking exhausting. And I kind of want the cavalry to come and just offer me some jobs. And it would be really amazing not to work that hard. Um, and this is the really, really hard truth. And the truth is, still, <laughs> when you're at this place, when I am at this place I am at, the cavalry is not coming. It sucks, but this is where the good news starts to come in, okay? Because you're gonna look back at your career and say, okay, I made critically acclaimed short films, and ran around and made some friends at a festival. I made two micro-budget features, one with Randy Hercules. I got a TV show licensed with Randy and Dingleberry. I'm making some money. I'm producing films for my friends. How is it possible that the cavalry is not coming anymore. I've done so much, and the good news of this is, who gives a fuck about the cavalry? Because now you are the cavalry. I'm gonna Tony Robbins you for a second. You are the cavalry, and you do not need them. You have a group of friends who you support and has your support, and in the peaks and valleys of our career, as they get more successful and you start to burn out and make a shitty movie, they will lift you up because you lifted them up. And when you're up and they're down, you will lift them up. And this will equalize you and not only sustain you through your career, but sustain you with people you like being around. You have a bevy of work behind you and not one of those pieces of art are you embarrassed to show your children later on because you made them exactly the way you wanted to make them. And while they didn't make a ton of money for you, you, can look your kids in the eye and say, yeah, I'm proud of this, I made this. And most importantly, you're now in a corner of the sandbox that is completely your own. You have all the skills to make exactly the kind of things you wanna make. You have enough money to put them in production in a micro budget way, admittedly, it's a bit of a limit. Um, and no one can stop you from doing exactly what you wanna do. So this to me, is only my experience, but I, I wanted to share this with you because I, I feel that if you can accept that the cavalry won't come and just make yourself into the cavalry, it has your best chance of maintaining success, but more importantly, which we don't talk a lot about in this industry, it gives you a chance to be happy. That's all I have to say. So, that being said, I know I made a lot of grandiose statements, and I know there's some specifics left out. I would also love to be challenged on any of that, these ideas if some of you were like, oh, that's bullshit. Doesn't play that way for me, because I'm still trying to dial this model in myself. Um, so I would like to open this up to questions, or if you're interested, just like really awesome compliments. Those are cool too. Um, and uh, I will open the floor to you guys. I can't see very well back there, so I'm gonna, if someone has one, you just like shout it. 
Oh, there you are. Okay, good. There's a mic, and you just walk up to the mic. That's what happens. Hi, I'm Melody Brooke, and I'm a filmmaker. Hi, you. Melanie. Hi. And our first feature film is in post-production right now. Congratulations. We have a couple of minor stars in it. And, um, of course, now we're looking to try to figure out how to do the distribution side. Yeah. So any advice or direction that you can give around that would be great. Yeah, I mean, you want to head for the A-list festivals first, and you want to really, like, Sundance, South by Southwest, Tribeca, LAFF, AFI, Cannes, Toronto, Venice, these places that might be able to, you know, sell your movie. And I know I'm talking a lot about business here, but it's very important that you understand business to serve your creative. It's just a part of the game. Um, so go for those. Um, if you get in there, fucking A, you're good to go. If not, start looking at more of those second tier festivals that aren't necessarily sales markets, but are going to be building tools. And sometimes you can win awards at those festivals, which will bring more attention to it. Most importantly, go to those festivals and meet the other actors and the other filmmakers that you want to work with. Um, and start thinking towards your next movie. Always start thinking towards that. We've already started writing it. Great. Good for you. Have that at the festival so that when people see your movie and say, ah, I don't want to buy this one, what's next? That's great. Um, and then I would say most importantly, try to get yourself to a VOD service. Um, even some places like Vimeo that are like trying to brand themselves and might push you a little bit. Film Buff, even iTunes themselves. You know, um, Our great friend Matt Dentler supports young movies and he'll help place you on the front page a little bit and don't be afraid to self-distribute that movie um, and this is just a small logistical detail if you're have a company that's offering you no money and you don't like the guy um, who's running it I actually would recommend self-distributing instead of selling it to them because this movie which is not valuable now in nine years when you are really successful if you own that whole thing and you haven't sold it that's going to be your Blood Simple of Coen Brothers, and you're going to be able to sell that for a lot of money and maintain that value because they'll be like, oh, look what Melanie made back here, and you know, Sundance Channel will want to buy it or somebody. So um, hang on to it unless you find a good one. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. It's Promises Movie on Twitter and Facebook. Just so you Did you just fucking promote up in here? <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Good on you, kid. Good on you. Yes. This side. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm Ross. Hey, Ross. I have a question for you yeah. on the dynamic of, you know, we're in this age of we all do it all kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so you're an actor, you're a director. We, and I think that, that dynamic, um, I just want to know how you deal with the dynamic of when you say I'm an actor or, you, or you're in your own films. How do you uh, deal with kind of the egotistic nature of saying like, oh, I, I, you know, I directed it. Well, I also acted in it. But the reality is that I wrote it because I'm perfect for this. Like, how do yeah. you deal with The gross nature of creating roles for yourself <laughs> and how to not be ashamed of yourself as you maneuver through the world. <laughs> uh, no easy answer for that. Therapy, really good for that. Um, but I would say, you know, to my earlier point, um, I, there's a way to address that in my mind that is like, look, as a lot of great literature that says no one under the age of 30 makes a good piece of art that is not autobiographical, I have zero access to all other actors. What I do have is access to myself, who understands the material. So while I might not be the greatest actor in the world, it's nice having a filmmaker inside of the scene, because if I feel the fi it's not working, I can improvise around it and maneuver it. So until I find a better actor who's willing to work with me, I will do. Cool. And I think that that will hopefully make them respect you 20% uh, more. Sweet, thank you. Yeah. Probably not, though, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, after talking a little bit about indie filmmakers going into TV, I was wondering how you're feeling about the web series world. Um, I have a little experience in the web series world. Um, I made a series called Wedlock Independently, mm -hmm. and we took that out and, and, and sold it. And um, between you and me, it was definitely like... We made our money and back and like a little bit more, but it wasn't like a windfall financially. Um, but it was good because I think Vimeo honestly is a really good place uh, to to get that stuff out there. Their revenue shares are 90% to the artist and 10% to Vimeo, and they don't promote a lot, but you can kind of, uh, it, it's worth what you get out of them. So I really, really recommend making them independently um, and taking them out. You can make a web series if you design it cheaply. Again, according to the models I talked about, that's sort of available school, uh, available material school. 
Um, so my, my advice would be like, try to make it for 10 grand or, or less. Um, you can probably feel comfortable to credit card that because any decent web series that's like funny, if you drive your ass off with all your social media and stuff, will make that back and, you, and you'll be okay to make another one. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey, man. Um, so I'm a really big fan. Thank and, you. Um, sometimes I feel like Alex from your togetherness. In which way? In, in the like in the balding way? In <laughs> yes, and in just the way that like I'm an actor in L.A. And what if one day I'm going to end up like him? And the other yeah. part of me is like shows like yours give me hope as an actor mm -hmm. because I I want to be part of projects like that. And in 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 terms of what is your um, advice for struggling actors in L.A.? And, and yes, I know I, I make my material and all that. Yeah. Really getting in like my first TV credit seems like this inbred game that I just can't get into. So yeah, I mean, there's no short answer for that. Uh, you know, everything I talked about in the last half hour applies to you as well as an actor because, you know, I think that the actor producer and the actor writer role are the best ways to get yourself moving forward. There's a little bit of a thing, and I'm just speaking super candidly, a lot of filmmakers, when an actor approaches them, they feel like they take a step back because they're worried they want something from them. And they're worried that that friendship is tainted with this desire to just be in their movies. But if you have acted in a movie that you wrote and produced, a five minute short, and you're at the film festival circuit, then you are one with the filmmakers and you are not coming to them for a job. And you guys will be buddies together and you'll go to that free party with a beer and you'll stay up late and you'll tell this really funny story about the time you got in the car accident and accidentally ran off and got arrested for a hit and run. And that filmmaker will hear it and he'll be like, she's so dynamic and so interesting, I wanna work with her. <laughs> and that's how this shit happens, I mean, you need to make yourself a member of this community as opposed to trying to burrow your way into the community because that's really, in my experience, I cast and call for my group of friends um, and, and the way into that and the way that that community is created is mostly through traveling to film festivals with a, with a decent piece of art. So think about what you're really, really good at doing. Like, you know, you know what you kill at, right? Okay, well, you got to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, you got to figure that out. You're probably being falsely modest, but like, you got to figure that out. Like, I'm so good at doing this kind of thing and write a five minute piece for that and produce it, which really only means just like finding a friend with a camera who kind of knows how to shoot um, and start making shorts like that, you know, and get that into a festival. And then it will start to grow from there. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mark. My name's Elisa. Hi, I'm Elisa. I'm a fellow UTRTF alum. Um, I really enjoy togetherness. Thank you. And the party episode, my friend and I watched that and also enjoyed some similar tea. Good. And it was a wonderful episode. Are you drinking that right now? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just really nervous and excited to talk to you. Because there's a little <laughs> something in your speech. I'm going to be Is honest there? with you. It's a little. Not, not tea. Not okay. Tea. <laughs> just checking. Um, so I was wondering if there was... It's not even noon, by the way, just <laughs> so you know. <laughs> if there's a specific personal experience that inspired that episode. And also, is Linda going to be coming back for season two? Mm, good question. Um, I can't talk about the season two stuff yet. We're right in the middle of writing it. Um, but as to the personal experiences for uh, one of our protagonists drinking hallucinogenic beverages... Um, I haven't had an experience like that necessarily before, um, but you know, Jay and I are really, really close. Um, and I remember when, God, I think, we grew up in New Orleans, so take this with a grain of salt, we grew up pretty fast. Um, I got a hold of some mushrooms in high school and Jay came back from college and I was like, we're gonna do these together. And because we spend so much time apart, I wanna like, I want to like expand together and like get you know like be be like we were as brothers. Um, and so we took mushrooms and walked around the streets of New Orleans together for I don't know maybe like five or six hours. And I do remember something in that. We didn't have any great crazy experiences or hyperbolic ones like happened in the episode. Um, but I do remember feeling like we were pretty like wound up kids who were nervous about like are we going to be able to have careers? Like we were thinking about this stuff 
in high school already. And I remember it kind of like opening us a little bit. And I was like, oh, that would be really great for tightwad Brett to, uh, to let the T let him loose. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mark. My name's Calvin Herbst. I'm 17. I'm a filmmaker from Dallas, Texas. Um, I can definitely... Right away, I know you're going to be successful. Uh, the, whole, the whole professional delivery that you're 17 and you call yourself a filmmaker, you are, you, you, you're, you're good, dude. You don't need me. Thanks. I don't really know what to say. Sit down, dude. I'm serious. Sit down. <laughs> Give somebody else a fucking chance, actual, man. actual question. Um, so definitely in that same boat and not having a lot of budget. Like, yeah. your, your number was like $1,000. So, and I'm blessed to come from a school where I have cameras and, like, lights that I can check out. So, um, Great. what what do you spend that money on? Because I have, like, that's, like, my worst budgeting. Like, I go out and I budget for a movie, and I spend all my money on Whataburger, and we're like, shit, we're out of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know. What, do you, what are some good investments that you actually took that money on and you spent it on? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I quote the $1,000 movie, it's, it's, it's certainly uh, not an empirical number. It, it changes on the city you're in. It changes, you know, depending on the scope of your movie, you know? But when I think about that movie, it's, it's doing a couple of things. It's, it's you know, borrowing recycled hard drives from people so you're not buying those things. You know, it's getting the uncompressed uh, app on your iPhone, which you have your equipment already. Most of it is food, um, and you really want someone who can cook. I recommend having your, um, your editor um, be the dit person who takes the media in, cause, and they have a lot of downtime, so you have them help you light, and you have them cook, and if, if they cook, and you, you know you should be having a crew that's really really small, and you should have designed an aesthetic of the movie that can be rough hewn, so it doesn't feel less than a two hundred thousand dollar movie. It feels squarely a one thousand dollar movie. What what that is, i.e., handheld, i.e., you know, um, rough lighting for a reason. You know, um, so yeah, that that money should be mostly spent on food, and then you're going to spend a little bit of that on film festival applications. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hey Mark, um, my name is Calvin too. Um, I'm an editor. Um, okay. And I cook, but never. Yeah, yeah. Cook on set. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I like um, it. I'm an editor, and I'm a film editor by day, filmmaker anytime in between. Yeah, um, I did that for a long time. I know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's also a great way to make money. Just to be clear, if you are is. a filmmaker who knows how to edit, getting in editing like infomercials and things like that. I edited at a church in Austin, a church television show, for $20 an hour at night. That was great for me. So it's a, it's a nice source. No, I totally agree. Um, in the episode of Togetherness, when you really find the coyote noise, mm -hmm. you put the coyote noise in. I've had that experience <laughs> plenty of times. I'm so sorry. No, I just, yeah. just want to tell you, I've, I've been there, man. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the puffy chair. I'm kind of going through some of that stuff right now, actually. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that Red Envelope um, Productions, you know, was one of the, was one of the production companies, you know, that helped start that brand. And I want to congratulate you on your deal with Netflix. Thank That's you. That's really cool. And I was just wondering if there's any correlation between that. Yeah, we developed a relationship with Netflix in 2005 when we sold them the Puffy Chair. Their originals department was called Red Envelope at the time. Mm -hmm. that, that's just been folded into the Netflix brand since. Um, and Ted Sarandos, who runs that company um, and is now like a multi-gazillionaire, massive media mogul, is one of us. He's a guy who came from independent film, and he feels like us, and he still takes my phone calls, and we text each other and talk about movies. And um, that brings to a good point of, like, we're now in this fortunate position where we're seeing the advent of venture capitalist conglomerations <laughs> showing up into independent film. Yeah. Amazon, Netflix, to a certain degree, HBO. And uh, that's why I brought up that idea in my uh, tirade earlier about sort of making independent television and licensing it to, to, to TV because there is Netflix, Amazon, they're minting money right now. Um, and then there's you and all of us who are kind of like not making a lot of money. And so there's this wonderful marriage to be had where you make the movie for this, or they, they buy the movie for, for half of what they normally buy it for. You've made it for a tenth of what right. they normally right. buy for. And then everybody is winning. You're profiting, they're profiting, you know. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. The budgets that I am making my Netflix movies for 
all four of those movies equal to basically one fart bubble for Netflix <laughs> and their grand scheme of money. So, but for me, it's a ton. So that's a good thing. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Hey, what's what's going on, Mark? Um, you know, just doing a keynote and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think about getting some coffee after this. What you up to? Uh, not, not a whole lot. Yeah. Um, a quick question, man. Cool. Um, okay, so big fan of the show, by the way. I wanted Thanks. to give you. Yeah. Did um, you write these down? Yeah, I did. You know, I, I really like did. This. Uh, from a film. How many parts? <laughs> <laughs> It's three acts. <laughs> okay, good. Right. Um, no, from a fi filmmaker standpoint, how do you feel about location and and the need to be in in, in L.A.? Yeah, um, I, I'm Re I'm really strong opinions about yeah. that. Um, there is a moment when it is helpful to be in L.A. It is so much better for you to keep making your stuff in a small town while you're finding out who you are because your rent's going to be two hundred and sixty-five dollars a month. You're going to get support from the pharmacist when you want to shoot in the pharmacy because your dad knows him. You know, when we shot the puffy chair, we shot it mostly in my wife's hometown. She grew up in where her dad was a doctor. And so we could shoot in the motel for free. We could shoot in the doctor's office for free. I really think it's very, very tough to make independent films in LA unless you kind of have a name or something to offer them. They will just be like, get out of my face, basically. So. Uh, to use my speech, up until the point in which you have made your $1,000 movie with Randy Hercules, that is the moment when you could consider moving to L.A. to get jobs. But Zellner Brothers, still living in Austin, making their movies, doing their thing. It's a great way to do it. Thank you. Yeah. I would, I would only add it's important if you're an actor. If, you're like, if you want to get that portion of your career going, it's, that's important to be in L.A. for. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, Mark. I'm Jeremy Burgess. I'm a writer producer out of Birmingham, Alabama. I've been doing shorts for a few years Great. and it's been going OK. I've also been working on my first and only feature length script. Mm -hmm. uh, it's brilliant, but it's it's going to be that. I already I knew it's going to be expensive. And yeah. uh, and that's always been in, in the back of my mind yeah. the whole time I've been writing it. Should I throw that in a closet and let the brilliance burn into my soul? Or should I keep working at that instead of shorts? How do you how do you that? do with um, multitasking? Fairly fairly okay. I have okay. like four jobs. Yeah, I mean, and and have your short films been going around to festivals and like doing We're okay? We're wrapping one up in about a week, and uh -huh. so I'll I'll tell you next year. Okay, got it. Yeah. So I would I would stay on the shorts train, making shorts until you get those shorts into the festivals and and really where you're at. I would finish that super passion project of yours that's brilliant and expensive and have that and have that ready to go. Because again, there is that chance that if you make this short and Janet falls in love with it and she premieres it at South by Southwest and it's also in the same shorts program as Randy Hercules' friend who made it, Randy might f see your movie, uh, your short and say, I wanna make it and then you can get your big movie made. Don't wait on that, do not count on that. The chances are very slim. So I would highly recommend whatever that first short is that you make that lands at a festival and you really see people connecting to it, try to make that micro-budget feature that mimics that, and that will be a great gateway to get your more expensive movie made. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm finishing up uh, UT RTF studies uh, this semester. And uh, every contact I've made in the industry has said, try to find a writing partner, try to find a producing partner. How has Jay um, helped your process out emotionally and like in the business? Aspect? It's huge. I mean, it is really, really huge. And I, I do agree with that advice. Um, and I would take it further that not just a partner, but a true community. You know, I showed up at South by Southwest in 2003 for the first time and started meeting guys like Joe Swanberg and Andrew Bujalski and Ryan Fleck and Anna Bowden. And we are all friends to this day. And we, call each other through the years and say, can I borrow a camera? And we mail each other cameras and we mail each other cards and can I use your old drives from this movie? I mean, that, that community element is almost as important as that direct partner. Very hard to find that direct partner, you know? I mean, it's like being in a band where you have to suck up all the conflict that happens with it for the greater good of the music that you're making together. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, just talking to you right now, like 
seem like a pretty gentle, sweet person, the fact that you're aware that it could be helpful means you're probably going to be emotionally evolved enough to handle that kind of situation. I'm which an is only child. So you're, you're, oh, wanna never mind. You're done. Right. You, no, no, no. <laughs> never mind. You're, you need a whole new career. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, re really hard to find, but certainly scope it out. You know, I will say that I'm in, I'm in two positions. I have my main partner with Jay, but Jay and I also have affairs on each other where, like, he goes off and makes, like, transparent, and he, uh, you know, went and, and acted in this movie, The Manson Family Vacation, that's premiering here tomorrow, and, and I kind of shepherd a little bit and guide, but, like, I stay away because he needs to have those other partners, and I do that with, like, Lynn Shelton and, and Colin Trevorrow and these other people, and, and so you can also have one-off creative relationships that work really well, too. Just good sex, basically, is what that is. As opposed Thanks, to, Mark, you're the yeah. man. Hey, um, Mark. I, I'm Eric Pachicano, and uh, I'm a uh, producer, filmmaker. Okay. You know, producer, writer, actor, actually. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to thank you personally um, because I, I honestly didn't know who you were before I walked in here. Um, get, get out. I, get <laughs> out. <laughs> um, but I didn't. I did. Get out. You're on my list of things <laughs> to watch. Okay. Togetherness is, is on my list, and That's it has been excellent. for a while. So I would have known. In the future, yeah, and um, so that's exciting. It's an incredible <laughs> statement, but <by the> <laughs> so I would have known in the future. Yeah, it's definitely true. If you um, make that the title of your first movie. Yeah, somebody's yeah. gonna watch it. <laughs> oh, yes, they will. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to thank you personally because you uh, have just confirmed everything that I personally have kind of set as far as my career and what I'm gonna be doing in the next, uh, you know few years, well, lots of years, but, um, and I wanted to kind of on this level say thank you and say, remember me, I'm Eric with an A, and one day we'll be on that level together, and I'll talk with you, shake your hand, and say, I appreciate everything, and I'm here because of you, so thanks a lot. You gonna raise it. me up? You gonna hook me up? Yeah, one day we'll, we'll hook each that. other up, I'm I promise. feeling that, I like so, uh, the confidence. All yeah, right. it's Eric with an A. I will be, I, let me be clear, I will be totally burned out and worthless in 10 years, so I'm gonna need that. Well, I'm here, I'm here in Austin, and, okay, and good. So <laughs> good. at some point, All have right. a great day. Excellent, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Mark, uh, I'm Puma Tanapan. I'm also a filmmaker in high school. Um, I, next year I'm gonna be a senior, and I'm kind of moving forward into this next level education yeah. of choosing what to do college-wise. Tricky call. And I also don't want to dig my mom into a hole and Great. go to somewhere super expensive. Great thinking. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how I should move forward into going yeah. to college, basically. Uh, uh, this is, I don't want to be irresponsible here because this is like a four-hour conversation, but I will throw out a couple of questions for you to think about. Um, do you believe that you thrive better in a structured educational environment, or do you function better as a renegade in your basement with your three buddies? What makes you more excited and inspired? Both. Both. Okay, I good. Think on, the, on the inside, I have this sneaking suspicion that I'm irresponsible yeah. uh, and I can't handle responsibility. Okay. But at the same yeah. time, I feel like having that lack of responsibility yeah. allows me to be... So there's a, there's a combination here. There are these, um, there are these uh, trade schools, uh, like New York Film Academy. Um, they're not the greatest things in the world, to be honest with you, but they're like nine months. And what they do is they teach you the, the empirical tools of filmmaking. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you and your mom won't go broke. You won't waste <laughs> four years. And you'll be, which is good, you'll be like 19 when you get out. Um, and you'll know everything you need to know about making movies. So even if you run for two years trying to make movies and you decide, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm not sure I'm this, as you uh -huh. mentioned. You're still only going to be 21 and you got plenty of time to yeah. clean all that up. So I, for college, I generally recommend go in and get just the necessary things that you absolutely need to make the movie. Granted, if you came to me and said, dude, I've already read all the textbooks. I know what the 180-degree um, axis is of shooting, yeah. and I know how to shoot uncompressed on an iPhone, I would be like, 100% do not go to film school. You are ready for this. Okay. Go out and do it. So you're saying like, if I already have that experience, which I, I think I kind of do, yeah. just do something else? I would else. skip it. I would, yeah. I would save the money and skip it. And think about the money that would have been that and say, Mom, give me a tenth of that so I can go make my movie, one movie. Uh -huh. Yeah. All righty. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Hi, Mark. I'm Stacy. Hi, Stacy. I took a BuzzFeed quiz on which league character are you. And I did not get your character, Pete, but I got Kevin, so I think that we're inherently linked. Absolutely. Rose. 
Um, yesterday I saw, I'm not a filmmaker, but I'm a curious individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, yesterday I saw David Chang speak on um, Momofuku and what's going on in the future of food. And something he said that I thought was interesting was about how today's chefs, um, anyone can kind of have all these access, have all these tools Mm -hmm. from the internet. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of hard for a young chef because they're expected to be good right away. Mm -hmm. And in your perspective for the future of film and future filmmakers, do these tools, would you say, I mean, they seem to have a lot of um, benefits to mm-hmm. becoming a filmmaker early and starting your career much earlier than you were yeah, able to do. Right. What do you think about maybe... The downside of that is what correct. you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the cheap technology and the tools, and I would never uh, wish that they were not here. I do agree there are some downsides. Um, one is that we're creating a glut of material in the marketplace, so it's much harder to sift through things. And also that, you know... In 1995, if you put out an independent film that was decent, you were only one of seven independent films, so everybody would come see it. Now there are thousands, so it makes you less, quote-unquote, special in that way. But the major upside of it, which I will trump to the day I die, is that because this stuff is so cheap now, um, in 1995, uh, a kid from Ohio in the suburbs who was 14 years old couldn't turn a camera on himself and make one of the more explosive movies that we've seen come out of Sundance, and that could happen now with the technology, and so I'm willing to take all the bad stuff for that sort of like juggernaut potential. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mark, Hefe Greenheart. I am a freelance DP, mm-hmm. and I'm uh, you know, transitioning into moving more in the direction of taking filmmaking seriously, yeah. uh, doing writing and directing, and I feel like I can learn a lot from being on set with an established director and, and learning approach and process. Um, what's the best way to uh, approach somebody you really respect, you lo- love their style, and you want to learn something from them uh, by working behind the scenes on set mm-hmm. and kind of break into the sort of like insulated bubble that's yeah. maybe around them? I mean, I'm going to give you a pretty specific piece of advice, you don't necessarily have to follow it, I would erase that from your memory. Um, because you will maybe learn some things, but it will probably uh, be really hard to get to that point if you don't have connections, and you'll spend a lot of time and energy trying to find a connection to a filmmaker that is good enough that you want to emulate. And it might not even be healthy for you to learn and emulate from them. And I would take all those cumulative hours and I would gather up three or four of your friends and start making movies. And then what's going to happen is you're going to start making movies that are like you and that are totally unique. And honestly, if you start emulating things, it might beat something original out of you that you never could have known. For instance, if you don't know what the 180 degree axis is right now and how to shoot films, you might shoot it in this ignorant way that's totally original (laughs) and interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of cool too. That happened to me a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, at the risk of... uh, sounding a little cavalier about it, I would really spend more of your time finding out who you are as opposed to shadowing someone else. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Hi, my name's Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. I love all your stuff. Thank you. I just wanted to tell you that, first of all. Um, I'm not a filmmaker, um, just kind of a creative person. I write a food blog. And um, I don't know, today... There's so many people out there that want to do something creative and yeah. so many different markets. And I was just kind of wondering, like, is there enough room? Like, how do you make yourself stand yeah. out? Yeah. I mean, it's a really tough question. There's a glut, you know, like there's tons and tons of stuff to look at. And it's much harder to make room. And it can be certainly um, a bummer sometimes when you just feel like I'm just putting the stuff out there and nobody cares, you know. I truly believe at the end of the day, like everybody's unique. And if you dig in hard enough about that special stuff about you, again, those conversations you're having with your friends, those very specific things that make you, you, um, that's going to be inherently fascinating, at least to me, you know, if I got a chance to like see and feel what it's like uh, in your life in that in those moments and if you can find a way to put that in your stuff I, I believe it can break through you know, but it's definitely harder now with the glut easier okay. to make harder to get people to watch it Thanks, I think we got We're running out of time, but I think we can do one more and I think it's you Hey, oh wait, shit. There's a guy in a green over there. Okay. We're gonna do two more real quick. Okay. We're gonna go in fast <laughs> Hi Mark. I'm Gail Bean. How are Hi. You? 
I, okay, it'll be quick, but I have a couple of questions. Oh, shit. No, it'll be real quick. All right, here we go. Okay, so I'm an actress, writer, and producer. I was just in um, Chris Swanberg's Unexpected. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. How is it because you do multiple things? When you come off, coming off of unexpected, people automatically see actress. Mm -hmm. And I don't really, I'm, I don't really know how about how saying I'm an actress, writer, and producer mm -hmm. without it like toning down the fact yeah. that you act. What is your advice on that? I mean, you just have to actively combat that and just say like, uh, yeah, I mean, I was in the movie because I'm a friend of Chris's, but really I'm a filmmaker first, you know? And that's th that standard response. You keep doing that over six months. That's, that's what's going to happen. That being said, it's not bad that people... Uh, are looking at you to be an actress, um, and if they like you in it, that's good, you know, and you should say, great, interesting, I'm not just an actress, I am an actress and a writer and producer, and I have this script that I have written for myself, and it can be made cheaply, and you want to get involved, you know, I mean, you, you just got to take control of that conversation. Okay, and then my second question would be, so coming off of that, when you are approached about other projects mm -hmm. that, um, like how you said, the Calvary's not coming, and then when it does come, it could be like, a bunch of crap that you may not want to do or yes most of the time it is how do you say no well uh, a lot of times it's easy because it's not an offer to you it's an offer to fight for it that's the key it sounds like they'll take you in for a meeting and say we want you to direct this movie but what they don't tell you is that they're talking to 25 other people and you're gonna have to go pitch to them and spend a month getting your boards ready and getting your story pitch together and you're not gonna get it and you will do that over and over again. And I can't tell you how many friends I have who've done that for three years straight because the temptation of getting that million dollar gig is there and they end up doing absolutely nothing. And that's really the, the bummer of the cavalry is coming. Is It sounds like it is, but it really isn't. Okay, cool. That's it, see? Okay, that was, well, that was a little long, but we're pretty good. All right, green guy. Hey, uh, so I'm an actor, writer, and I work for this startup too. And uh, I, I guess, the question is, how do you, or can you ever get rid of like the this is no good voice yeah. that is in your head? Because I have a million ideas. Yeah, the, yeah the, and the this is no good voice is great, and it's one of your great assets because it's oh. going to help you from making something bad. You know, If you have the bliss gene and you're like, this is awesome, you're never going to know that it sucks. So um, that's a good thing. Okay. Accept it, honor it, go to some therapy, you'll work through that. All right. I'm still doing that. Um, a couple of uh, tricks uh, when you're writing. Um, I find it's very bad to write in final draft or in a document because you can see what you're writing and you're thinking to yourself, oh God, it's garbage, it's garbage, and you lose all your confidence. So try this trick where you take a little dictaphone or a handheld recorder and you speak out your scripts into it. You can't see the words. Also, you can't turn back. It's linear. And so what you actually have to do is it forces you to just get a vomit draft out. And you accept. Because this is a vomit draft, it's going to be stinky. That's fine. No big deal. So your dialogue will all sound the same because you're talking that way. <laughs> and your scene descriptions will not be eloquent because you talk them out. But you're going to get impeccable pacing because your body knows how to pace a movie because you've sat in front of so many movies. And so then you can click into that other side of your brain this is no good brain, and start empirically editing that thing. Um, and that's a nice little trick for me. Also, involving your friends and your peers in every way, shape, and form in the process to take the voice off of you for this is no good and put it onto them and let them help you. You'll stop beating yourself up as much if everyone else is voicing and helping you guide this thing. People don't do that enough. I find a lot of people that get caught up in this auteur bullshit of like, this is my vision and I'm making it my way. And it's just like, no, making a movie is impossible. You need help. You need people you know and love and trust to help you guide this stuff. So um, a community will really help you with that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I'll stop talking now. And we're sourcing the ladies that will come to our academy in two avenues. First of all, through other companies that would like to take our program and have us train their ladies, or through the Ministry of Labor and the Human Resources Development Fund. We'll be working with ladies that then don't have jobs. And what we would do is work with almost like preferred vendors and do on-the-job training where they've got two days in our academy and three days on the job.